Welcome back, everybody. It's the second day um, of the Playground for the New Economy Festival. We're here online again, live from Selgar's Mill today. That's where I am. Everyone else is all over the place. Um, if you were not able to catch any sessions yesterday or you want to see what you missed because you were at a different session, you can go into the expo area. We have posted a booth that will take you to um, a bunch of recordings. All of the sessions, I think, are up there now or they will be pretty soon. So I think we've got about um, this morning we had all but two up. So and then the rest are going up. So definitely check out catch up viewing and you can access those um, for the next couple of weeks um, on Vimeo. And um, so yeah, that's a great way to um, kind of see what you missed. Um, there's a big, uh, the schedule for today is in the reception area. If you haven't seen that yet, just take a look. There's lots on, very exciting. Um, I'm gonna hand over pretty quickly to Hazel. Um, so she's going to be running the morning magazine review for us. So thank you Hazel for coming back again this year. Um, and she's joined by a couple of the presenters who we had from yesterday. Um, Anna Fielding and Anushka Dayton. So I'm gonna hand over to Hazel to introduce the session and how it works and the panelists. So thanks, over to you. Thanks so much, Abby, and good morning, everybody. How many people do we have? Is it this 77 number at the top that tells me how? Um, no, it's a little bit further down. It's the 16 number at the moment, but I'm going to get the um, festival crew to invite everybody to come in. I've put a, put a few notes in the chat. In the chat. Um, <laughs> so hopefully we'll get more as they join. So. Great. Okay, great. Yeah, I was just saying to Abby, normally magazine review is a very relaxed affair, lots of hungover people in the fields in the middle of their breakfast, plugging, trying to get their So we're going to try and recreate that, <laughs> maybe with fewer hangovers. Um, <laughs> but yes. hangover, no. <laughs> no, sadly no, it's, it's only Wednesday. But um, we have an amazing panel here today and we've picked a few stories from the press in recent months roughly themed around the new economy that we're going to be talking about and the idea is that we just talk about our ideas about these articles and that we hear from you guys as well about what you think of these different themes so abby tells me you can join us on the screen if you're so inclined um so if you want to say anything on camera please feel free to activate your video and I'll be able to see you pop up in the moderation panel or just feel free to come in on the chats with any thoughts that you have any questions any ideas any other articles you've read similarly themed and we will try and include everybody's ideas so first of all I'd like to do a couple of introductions my name is Hazel Sheffield I'm a journalist and a reporter on the new economy. Some of you might know me from the project that I run, mapping local economies in the UK. I also write articles for The Guardian, The Times, The Independent, various outlets, including STIR. And I have recently been working with Practical Governance on their patchwork quilt of uh, community businesses that have joined together to help one another um, with mutual aid during coronavirus and I'm happy to talk about any, any of those in more detail if anyone's interested uh, and I'm really happy today to have two amazing panelists with me Anushka's with us sadly only in voice at the moment but we may see her face appear later <laughs> Anushka, Anushka, can you hear me? Hello, sorry, you just broke up them. Yes, hi, I am here. Sadly, uh, you, I can't see me at the moment, um, but I shall uh, hopefully be getting that sorted shortly. Very excited to be here this morning. Are you, are you just from Manchester? Yeah, I'm linked. I'm up in Manchester. Um, okay. Yeah. That's what I had here on this bio, so I just wanted to double check. Um, I understand that Anushka has been the Programme Officer for Northwest of England for the Architectural Heritage Fund since 2019. Um, but she's also had first-hand experience of the potential for historic buildings to spur economic regeneration as a founder member of the Friends of Stretford Public Hall, 
which is a campaign to stop the local authority from selling a grade two listed hall, which is now a community arts venue. She was as the city council as a homeless family support officer and she's also a part-time acupuncturist running a not-for-profit holistic clinic very cool so Anushka can you tell us what you've been working on lately and maybe a little bit about what you presented yesterday when you did your session at STIR yeah so um currently I'm working for the architectural heritage fund as you mentioned and um, we've got a program running on um transforming places through heritage and this is really focused on getting not-for-profits um, who are looking after or taking over ownership of heritage buildings on high streets, um, giving them support and grants to help them along that journey. Um, something I did in my role as um, chair of Stretford Public Hall when we took over that building in our local area. So yesterday I did a session looking at the future of the high street, you know, what's kind of been working and not working for the high street and hopefully where, where things might be moving forward. And the sort of really important role of heritage buildings in that and community businesses as well as a key part to, you know, sort of the changing um, economic future we're going to have. Um, I think there's lots of things to be worried about, but I do see sort of green shoots of optimism on the horizon. And um, and I think now in this kind of very changing world, it's a good opportunity we potentially have to, to make an impact. Great. Yeah, and there's a couple of stories actually I've picked today which are on the streets, so hopefully you can draw on your experience. Great. And then Anna is also joining us. Where are you, Anna? I'm in Birmingham. I'm actually in my niece and nephew's bedroom, which is why I have this screen here, because behind it's a bunk bed covered in toys. <laughs> so, yeah, camping out in Birmingham. It looks very professional. Um, <laughs> Thank you. eBay. Um, so I met Anna, as I'm sure many people here know her, from the Finance Innovation Lab, where she was the chief executive for many years, a pioneering charity building a financial system that serves people and planet. But Anna's got a new job as a senior advisor at the Economic Change Unit, a non-profit organisation working for a more resilient, secure economy. And I'll just read some of the CV. She is a trustee of New Economics Foundation, a former trustee of Just Finance Foundation and the New Economy Organisers Network and a judge for many industries. She's also, uh, your bio tells me, a writer. And you've had your work published in The Guardian, Stir, Pioneer's Post and the News. Good to have some behind the scenes knowledge there. Um, I wondered if you could tell us about your new <laughs> job, Anna. What is the Economic Change Unit? Yeah. So the Economic Change Unit is one part of my new job. Yeah. Um, so the the overall pieces that I'm I'm working sort of on a portfolio um, is is the fancy way to say it. Um, so I'm doing some studying. I'm studying um, psychotherapy to try and bring those skills into the movement and then I'm working part-time at a couple of organizations including the economic change unit and the economic change unit exists to amplify all the efforts of the organization working to build a new economy um, and I really the reason I wanted to work with ECU was because I think its mission is incredibly important I think there is a huge amount of exciting work going on both in terms of policy and practice and ideas for how we build a better economy and and to maximize the impact of that work we need to both join it up and kind of grow the niche internally to the movement but crucially we need to build a bridge to the mainstream we need to make sure that all these ideas and all the evidence that we have is really hitting the the thinkers and the conversations that have the power to shift the economy um, and the ecu basically exists to do that so it's kind of both providing a service to the movement but also trying to amplify what the movement does um, and I have kind of a, a general advisory role which which means working with the, the team mainly across issues relating to strategy and thinking about how we do something that I think is incredibly difficult which is really get this message beyond the people who already agree with us or who are already interested and get the message out to the much wider mainstream mm. and how's it going it's great. It's fab. I really enjoy it. I mean, it's interesting. When I left the lab, I thought what I wanted to do was just completely chill out, have a summer of reading books. 
Um, and then I said yes to too many things, including the ECU. And the summer has been a complete roller coaster. And I've, it turns out I like that. And and it it was me all along, basically. <laughs> Take me out of the job. I'm still the same person. <laughs> I know the feeling. Um, and tell us about your session yesterday. Um, technical problems aside, what were you actually write, uh, talking about? Um, so we were talking about leadership. Um, oh, hi, Anushka. I can oh, see you now. Lovely oh, to see you. Hi. Hi. Um, yes, we were talking about leadership, which I think is a subject we're often quite shy to talk about in the new economy, but I think it's really important that we do because I think it's critical to being successful in what we're trying to achieve and trying to build a better economy. Um, and we were looking at both kind of what leadership is, but also sort of what it isn't and how we can develop a language and a model of leadership that really works for the new economy. And we, we looked at some examples, including the Montgomery bus boycott, mm -hmm. and we drew on various ideas, including, you know, everything that you'd expect, like Marshall Gans through to Forbes and, and very corporate ideas of leadership. And in the end, I also shared just a few of my hard learned lessons about what it's like to try and run an organization in the new economy just in case anyone else was in the same position now and wondering if what they were experiencing was unique because i don't think it is right that sounds brilliant and i think abby we can access those sessions when we on catch up yes you can yeah you can go to the expo booth and then um click through and there's a vimeo link um that will have all of this catch-up session so yours is on there and, uh, and same with Anushka's as well. And this will be on later too, if anybody wants to watch this again. <laughs> okay, great. Good. Well, I encourage everyone to do that. I'm certainly going to check those out. So let's move on to our magazine review. I think it's been a really interesting time for the new economy in the media, personally speaking, because newspapers, just like everything else, have had to react really quickly to what's happened. Coronavirus, in, if you're in a newsroom right now. So the new economy has kind of had to play bit around that narrative um, of how communities have adapted to this new paradigm and what's going to happen to them next. So some of the articles that I've chosen today are about the high street in particular and how that's changed and what might come next. So the first piece I thought I'd share with you is called Goodbye to the Pratt Economy and Good Luck with What Comes Next. And it's a comment piece. I'm going to put the link here for FT subscribers. I can share my screen for non FT subscribers. Application window. Chrome tab. Okay. So this is the article. Goodbye to the Pratt economy and good luck to whatever replaces it. Just really quickly for viewers, if you double click on um, Hazel's screen share, you'll be able to see it a little bit bigger. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, great. So I'm hoping I can. So from the FT columnist Sarah O'Connor, it's an opinion piece, and she's talking about the rise and fall of Pratt and Manger. It would almost almost a third of its workforce after the past almost a decade of growth for the sandwich chain. A crisis set of the crisis facing city centres. And she says there are fears now that England city centres will become ghost towns. Um, and I like this, I think, particularly because I live in the southeast in London where there are Pretty every five paces. I mean, you look on a bus through London from one place to the other. And I was reading a, around this subject, ready for this magazine review. I read a really great article. And how that's basically, it's it, instead of a couple of preps in town centres in north of England, it's just gone for hard for London and the South East, so you're going to get like 30 in any London borough. Because I think there's this business model whereby if you see lots and lots of these businesses, then eventually you'll just give in and go in and away from there. Mm. So this um, is about the, the I guess, the fall strategy and how it's all started to come, um, 
come, all the chickens have come home to roost for prep. Um, and Sarah says that it's emblematic because um, the current city, city economy has these other problems. So all the good quality jobs, she says, are concentrated in London. And the high demand for these jobs has pushed up house and rental prices. All the city workers um, have then got to move further out from the centre and commuting times have become longer, transport infrastructure has become overstretched. So we have this really unsustainable model in city centres. And she thinks coronavirus is changing that economic arrangement. So now people know, businesses, bosses know, we know as workers, we can all work remotely. We don't need to be commuting in every day. We don't need to be putting up with those unsustainable um, stretched transport and infrastructure and people are spending she thinks people are spending more money in the independent shops and cafes in their local high streets because of that and she thinks that well-paid workers will spread into other parts of the economy so maybe London will lose its dominance so I'm really interested to hear what people think about that do we think that any of that's going to happen uh, is London going to become less important as our capital. Um, Anna, Anushka, do you want to start us off with that? Well, oh. from up here in the north, um, <laughs> we, we in some ways would um, encourage this. <laughs> you know, the idea that it's all this London centricity has, has had a massive impact for generations on the impact of of um, other areas and the regions as well, you know, other areas of, of the UK. And um, though it could be a bit painful as, as the transition happens, it could be in the long term an actual good benefit for the rest of the country um, to see a sort of different form of growth. Um, I do, I, I have seen the, the impact of home working. Um, I, I work from home anyway, but so many friends are now working from home and you know, it improves our lives in so many different ways. And people who have been lucky enough not to have a drop in income during this mm -hmm. period have been talking how much about they're going to start changing the way they spend money. So mm -hmm. maybe it will have a longer term impact if this home working continues, um, but that there'll be other things that will will potentially, you know, where that, where that spend, where you might have spent it in, in Pret or of a sort of on your transport might be spent in different areas of the economy and it'd be interesting mm. where that may be as we always seem to spend our means. Mm. That's a good point. Do you know from these conversations what other people, what they're spending their money on, what they're changing their spending habits to? A lot of it has been sort of improving the way they eat at home. Um, things like um, pets. <laughs> and when I know since you're getting an, another dog or and they're expensive things. Um, it, I'm not quite sure yet. It's hard to tell, isn't it? Because there's a lot of talk about trying to get healthier and, and it's really tricky at the moment. Mm. And everything. So, yeah, uh, it'll be interesting. It's really interesting what you're saying, Anishka, because I, I kind of feel like I was slightly ahead of the curve here in that in October, I moved back from London to Birmingham <laughs> to save money and all the money that I'm saving, I'm putting in a bank account so that I can do study because study is flipping expensive. Um, and I think I think that in itself illustrates a number of things about the unsustainability, unsustainability of the London centrism mm -hmm. model. Um, I think that the fact that I really didn't feel I could sustain my income, sorry, sustain a, a good standard of living in London. Um, and I certainly wasn't on the national minimum wage, you know, so in, in that sense, I was very lucky and still couldn't do it. But also the fact that, you know, for many years before moving down to London in 2015, I lived outside of London, particularly in the north and Bradford, probably for the longest amount of time. And I just don't think if I hadn't moved down to London and really got to know a lot of people in my very London centric job, I would have been able to then move to Birmingham and feel like I was bringing um, enough contacts and, and connection and experience with me to be able to, to work from here. So, you know, the whole thing kind of highlights how unsustainable this whole model is. And, and I think it will be fantastic if we do see um, growth in local economies, if we do, and, and the right sort of growth. And I think that's probably one of the important things is that, you know, 
where small independent businesses go big corporates and chains tend to follow um and my what you know you only see, you see that with coffee houses for example or sandwich shops and prep so i think one of my worries is that all we will see is kind of a scattering out across the country of the same forms of corporate dominance actually that will continue to squeeze out the local economy and i guess also that kind of that transition i think will be incredibly painful for people who already lack kind of power in the current economy. So I'm thinking about all the, the gig workers in London, the people who clean the offices, the people who deliver the, the sandwiches, like no one's going to be looking out for them policy wise if this trans transition does happen. They'll be focused on the people they see as their core constituencies who probably are either already living in the suburbs or out in Surrey or are able to make that move relatively easily, a bit like when the BBC moved to move lots of its operations to Salford. And, and what we saw was people moving from wealthy suburbs in London to wealthy suburbs in the greater Manchester region. So, you know, I think I don't, I don't, uh, this isn't an unqualified moment for rejoicing for me at all, because I'm a little bit cynical about how it's going to develop, but I'm also really worried about the pain that it's going to cause. And I guess a final thing there is, you know, working from home is great if you have a home you can work in, um, whether that means you've got people who can help with caring or whether it means you've got a room that you can that you can use as your study screen or no screen. And again, it's kind of like the people who were already disadvantaged in this economy. They're going to be the ones who end up struggling to adjust to that new lifestyle. So. I guess my and this is to do with my I guess my overall feeling with the building back better after COVID is unless we are very very conscious about it and influencing the way it goes and do our very best to ensure it's there for everyone actually we'll just kind of see the same problems but with a different flavor there's a ruder way to say that but I'm not going to say it right now yeah I totally agree I, I wonder if you have any insight into how we could avoid that from a kind of policy or any other uh, perspective mm. now I don't want to give you a very simplistic um partisan answer I think I don't think there is a single policy solution that will avoid that it's about having an a joined up set of policy mm -hmm. solutions that will ensure that the recovery prioritizes social economic and environmental recovery and values the things that matter not just conventional measures of growth like GDP I think there are a wealth of ideas out there from all the new economy organizations NEF Commonwealth positive money, IPPR, all of them have all these different proposals that are all different pieces of the jigsaw mm -hmm. to do with ownership or, you know, employee rights or valuing care work and so on. But they all kind of need joining mm -hmm. together. And I only think that will happen if there is the willingness to put them actually into play in the first place and see how to join them up. So really, this is a power question mm -hmm. as much as anything. So we have to wait for yeah. the election. And I would add to that, I completely agree with what Anna's saying, um, and, and the idea of some sort of very localised um, policy that, that, you know, you allow local authorities or other organisations to do some, some co-production on producing policies that work for their area, because it's, you know, even with them, somewhere like Manchester, the different areas need such different, different yeah. solutions. There'd be no one fix for, for any area mm -hmm. yeah and there's so many interesting things we can learn from like the Preston model like some of the work that's going on on the green economy in Bristol it's bringing all that together and kind of getting the right balance between sharing good practice mm -hmm. and and what works but also tailoring it to specific local mm -hmm. economies yeah. yeah yeah do you have anything else you want to say about um the Architectural Heritage Fund, Anushka, do you work on any of those kind of aspects in your... We tend to work on project-based um, 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 So the current programme is very much focused, though, around local um, government initiatives or things like the Heritage Action Zones. So we, when we're giving grants, we look at what else is happening in that specific place that the project or building is... is based in and seeing how that ties in because there's a sort of a great feeling that you know a project on its own is not going to be as impactful as if it's working with what else is happening 
Mm. So uh, at my building that um, I took over at Stretford Public Hall, um, when we bid for it, we managed to convince the council, you know, not to just accept our our um, monetary value, which we were to mm. offer. So we managed to convince them, you know, to look at other things in the bidding process, such as the benefit of the local economic development and community um, benefit. And we worked along the master plan that the council had had made, and they actually ended up rewriting it um, in part along the, along the lines of, of the sort of suggestions we had made. Um, and now we're involved in a future high bid as well in, in Stratford. And Sort of, I, it actually hasn't been brilliant the way they've worked with us, but I've seen lots of other future high streets where the local council has worked really closely with not-for-profits and other key um, players within the local um, economy and local um, uh, sort of local the other sort of key stakeholders, and they've had some really good outcomes of how they're thinking of using money. The sort of top-down approach never works, as we're sort of too aware of in in this field. Mm. Yeah, so, so at the Architectural Heritage Fund, we look, we are very much trying to make the most of heritage buildings in failing high streets and see how that those um, buildings can act as a catalyst for bringing in um, footfall, but also pulling together all the other sorts of um, Supporting other other independents that are in the area, working together with the other businesses. Mm. Yeah, that's so interesting. I wonder if that's going to become even more important as we chains and other big retailers struggle. Yeah, and what I would love to see, looking at some of the comments, <laughs> is yeah. available for purchasing not for profits or social enterprises to be able to purchase. Um, you know the properties. Are going to end up being empty before the venture capitalists get in there it'd be fantastic to be able to have some sort of ability to to yeah. do that so if anyone's listening <laughs> one, one word that's coming up quite a lot in the comments actually is courage mm -hmm. and i really agree with that like if we are not brave now there won't be the opportunities to be brave mm -hmm. in the future and by we there i mean the new economy movement i mean people who are building social enterprises co-ops i mean people at all levels of government or this, yeah that is this is the moment to be brave and to really make a stand for it because otherwise the system will just snap back to the way it was before 100 can i add just one thing to that as well it's about being brave and curious as well um you know if you see something mm. leaving and packing up and going find out what's going to happen with that um Space, you know, dig around who's lifting it, who's managing it, who's owning it. Because, yeah. and what we've seen certainly in Bridport um, a couple of times, these buildings that sort of that are what you would call a community asset, um, and then they sort of switch hands in, in the background, and suddenly it, it goes to a private owner and stuff. And it almost happens under your nose. And we live in a small, we live in a small community, so. Um, definitely sort of yeah be curious ask questions because you might be able to get in right at the right time and be able to kind of stop something that might otherwise go um, to another big corporate or something like that so yeah mm -hmm. is there anything else anyone wants to say about that article um on the prep question as prep as a business it's one thing we haven't talked about it's business model of just employing lots of low-paid workers and then kind of doing this weird surveillance thing where it sends in mystery shoppers every day and forces them to smile um i don't know if that um, does, it, does anybody see that kind of uh extractive employment practice how is that going to change <sighs> You know, I've never forgiven Pret since they stopped doing the Thai rainbow vegetable, <laughs> which was a th like that was so good. I do not know why they stopped it. But seriously, I mean, the problem with Pret and with uh, that I see, and with with all organisations that get that that become quite predatory, both in terms of the way they um, sort of approach the the economy they're working in, but also the way they treat their staff is that it all starts generally from fairly good intentions people don't say i want to create this mm -hmm. monolith that exploits people and yet 
incremental change by incremental change that's what you end up with you end up with jobs that are really oppressive for people to do because they're forced to do all this emotional work for a tiny mm. tiny wage really long shifts lots of insecurity what I guess this is not a straight answer to your question I suspect that prep will reinvent itself one way or another what worries me is now bringing tech into the picture actually and I think Amazon gives us a taste of that for the future like mm -hmm. in future they're not going to need someone to come in and see whether people are smiling mm -hmm. because they'll be able to tell that from using the, mm -hmm. the facial recognition or something similar to that like this to me is a really we're so busy focusing now on sort of the concrete things of life because they've been threatened but actually tech perfuses permeating all elements of our life is I think only going to increase mm -hmm. now and I think that will be a really driving factor in terms of who succeeds in our economy after Covid but also what that economy mm. is like. Well it's a petrifying thought. <laughs> Sorry, enjoy your breakfast folks. <laughs> Make sure you're smiling while you eat it. Okay, um, <laughs> okay, um, another article on Right here, but it's related, so I think I'm going to power through with the next one, which is an amazing visual analysis from The Guardian that was in this weekend. You may, may, may have seen it about how are recovering after lockdown. So I'll switch my screen to that. I'm going to take a quick look. Uh, here it is. Which is high streets are recovering after lockdown. So yeah, as I said, it's kind of related. It's an investigation by the Guardian using data from the local data company, and they basically, I think, sounds like they sent reporters to five different high streets between July 10th and July 20th, and they counted which shops on a high street that they've been monitoring had reopened. And you can see as you scroll through this article changes so the lights all go up in all the high street buildings during coronavirus and then the lights come on again in some of the buildings depending on which high street you're on and the findings were as we've kind of with Sarah O'Connor's piece in the bigger cities such as in Manchester they looked at spinning fields which some of you may know a, a kind of inner city and there, like, so this is spinning field three, you can see lots of the shops. Only 8% of them stayed open. So you can see those little yellow dots are the ones still open. And then after lockdown, 58% reopened. So yeah, I mean, as of the, it doesn't say now what the reopening rates are. But interestingly, in some of the smaller town centres, or more concentrated towns and just like sale. You can see everything's open there before lockdown. All goes off with only 25% left open and then 88% reopen. So yeah, outlets will reopen rates so about 90%. So that high street fared much better. And the conclusions of the reporters are that high streets that have a stronger community, local community, less of a offices mix, I guess, around them, did better and have reopened faster. So I wondered if people have found that where they live, if you've seen that in your high streets. Um, and Anushka, I don't know why Anna's left us briefly, but... Yes, yeah, so, so it's interesting for me because I live about a mile away from Sale and in fact, <laughs> to one of the shops there afterwards to get my daughter's football kit. So, um, yeah, so Sale, a bit like Stretford, has a very, very, is, is had a, its high street's always been a bit struggling. It's not the most attractive high street in the world, but people have done a lot of work at, at um, making sure that people support local businesses throughout lockdown, pre-lockdown as well. There was a big sense of, you know, make, there were the, the, the local government had done a lot of um, work on consulting with people when they were going to change the this, this status of sale, the um, sort of development of sale. And as a result, there was a lot of talk around you know, 
making set go shop and sell if you can and all that sort of thing and that um um support has been really key in lockdown so a lot of the local businesses like um takeaways would were um doing delivery a lot of the restaurants were being really innovative in the way that they were were managing to survive um and there's been a real push since lockdown for that to happen and obviously in spilling fields it's it's a very different place there are people living there there are flats but it's a lot more um single people and couples a lot, lot less of a sort of local community feeling because it's more disparate in the way that people live and work there um but that is set to change i think because the city center of manchester is going through one of the biggest ever housing developments mm. in its and if anyone's been here recently it's it's turning into skyscraper city it's phenomenal and i can't remember the numbers i did have them but there were there's going to be such a population increase mm. the currently it might be a really hard time for the city center but they are going to have people living there and that um is going to bring a lot more local footfall and potentially a change in the in the attitude to the way people view their city center mm-hmm. how do you feel about being a local resident it's it's a really tough one I, the, manchester needs a lot more housing everything else is a lot of it green belt the stuff that's not green belt is industry and those are really important for jobs um there's going to be a lot of pressure on schools in the area um i worked for homelessness for a long time and you know it's gone out of control in manchester mm. um that something drastic does need to be done but i'm not sure that high rises that are invested predominantly by um from outside of the uk who have very little interest in in the actual local gov- um local area is the way forward mm. I really do wish that local planning could have some sort of cap on it where people you know some local people were able to have first dibs in buying property um and I think it's going to create a huge bubble that will burst in the center because at the moment there's a lot of a lot of Chinese investment and that will quickly can quickly be pulled out when things start going downward which they are likely to given the rate of <laughs> rate of flats um being built so you know the center of manchester is is suffering at the moment it's really and people are have been going out a little bit but not nearly enough to to pre lockdown um levels so it's going to be a very tricky time for the city center i do think these lo- um local high streets will continue to benefit mm. what about if it- thinking there about what would be the ideal situation you know you said Manchester's got these problems with homelessness and there is a shortage of housing there what is an alternative reality another situation that you you could envisage happening if there was maybe a different uh, political will in the local authorities or um, different kind of policy vision what could be done it's very tricky it needs to be a change on so many levels because the support has all been taken away as well mm. so what we find is um people particularly street homeless people aren't just going to the city center to get you know because they have no choice a lot of people do have some form of temporary accommodation be it you know not necessarily suitable but there's the loneliness element there's mm. a social life that goes alongside it there's the access to to um you know being able to beg and get get money so to get people out of that you need a lot of tailored support you need um support for people longer term while they while they're you know supported into different areas and there's got to be a will in so say people came to stretford <laughs> there is them around it there is everywhere and you have to have a really good good support network for people that are trying to come out and that's why it's make, making use of those local assets that are already there the sort of support groups we have a really fantastic organization that um does runs a cafe for people that um are former alcoholics and a lot of those are street homeless and they have really done a lot it's 
of being able to pull people out of that situation and give them you know life long long years of support that is required for people mm. there's no easy fix no that's the thing it's such a complex issue at this point isn't it did you want yeah. to tell me Anna? i know you missed a bit while we were going through the article but is there anything you'd like to know about local high streets bouncing back yeah i was punished by whoever is watching my face for smiles or something. <laughs> yeah Apologies. Um, so I guess what one of the angles I think is missing here is the the intersection between what we want the big issues like our local high streets and homelessness and the housing crisis and the companies, the private companies mm -hmm. that are seeking opportunities to not exploit this, but there is a gap there, there is a need for for buildings and they fill it. And my question is why are they doing this? Because you know I Manchester is a city I know and love dearly. A big piece of my heart is there, and I've seen the the high rises mm -hmm. going up. And my question is, why are they going up? Are they going up because these companies are looking to build good homes, and in mm -hmm. doing so, um, have a successful company, a successful commercial venture, or are they doing it because they see an opportunity to make a major profit? because they see this as an investment market because I think the decisions will be so different and it's the same with really every kind of housing development I used to work at Ecology Building Society and there it was amazing because everyone we lent to they were trying to build properties that provided good homes that also respected the environment and the whole process from start to finish is completely different all the decisions you make are completely different and I think if private companies are going to be a major part of our housing supply of the future which I'm sure they are then we need to start looking at the purpose of these companies and the motivations within which they're going into developments I'm not saying that they can't make a profit but if that's the only purpose then you know I have real questions about whether those schemes are going to turn out well for the residents and for the local community. I think we look at we look at all the brutalist buildings from the 70s and all the kind of concrete living in the sky experiments and think how could we allow those to happen but at least there there was a vision at least mm. there when you look at what the architects and developers were trying to do they had visions of how life would be in the future. Mm. Their visions were wrong and, and that's <laughs> resulted in uh, you know those those properties and those buildings sometimes being really not nice places to live and, and there's a lot of work going on now to try and rejuvenate them but you know at least they had this aspiration above and beyond let's create a building and make some money out of it I think that's just whatever scale we're looking at this whether it's city centre or a local high street mm. that's got to be a major factor. Mm. No, I think you're absolutely right, that vision question. I just want to read out a couple of amazing comments as well we've had. Um, yeah, Johnny posted something from Paul Hayes on Twitter. High Street, the station, I like that, in British towns and cities, back to the cities. It's not something else. Um, yeah, I like that idea that maybe it's just a relic. We need to move past it in, in the language. And I really want to thank Miranda for so active in the chat today. And I loved what she said here about this idea of thinking in more linear ways of individual solutions rather than system thinking because I think system thinking is such a buzzword isn't it um yes she picks up on what Anishka said about is a whole series of required how can we envisioning climate and ecological resilience it's a great point as well about how we need to adapt our city that can be our vision I guess about how we can create more environmentally conscious and friendly cities to face these challenges. Okay, I've definitely hogged the chat with my articles there. <laughs> Ishka or Anna would like to go next with one of their stories. Any uh, volunteers? I'm happy to go next if that's okay with you Anishka, yeah. Definitely. Um, I apologise to anyone who's still eating breakfast because <laughs> this is not a cheerful story. Um, but I really wanted to share it because it, it was released about a month ago, I think it was 4th of August, um, and I'm still angry about it. Um, <laughs> and it's a story in Vice uh, magazine, and the headline is, Corporations Receiving Bailout Billions Have Laid Off Staff and Paid Investors. And Vice has undertaken an investigation with support from a number of new economy organisations, I should say. And they've basically found that really big 
really big companies have been bailed out with millions and millions of pounds of public money through something called the COVID corporate financing facility. And at the same time, they have been paying their shareholders huge dividends and cutting tens of thousands of jobs. You know, so they found 21 companies of the, the group that have been funded so far through the CCFF. Um, and they've been paid 11.5, they, sorry, they have paid 11.5 billion pounds in dividends. Mm -hmm. And eight of those paid that after they've been given government money. So it's basically like someone has designed a pipe that takes money out of everybody's pockets and funnels it to people who were already incredibly wealthy and powerful. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing that really gets me is after the 21st of May, companies who received it, this is what the government said, had to sign a letter committing to restraint on executive pay. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is that just saying, I promise to be nice, I promise to be good. And how is it that if you if you miss the bus to go to your appointment for universal credit, you get fined, whereas these big mm -hmm. companies just have to sign a letter and how is it that companies like easyjet got 600 million pounds easyjet got while it was laying off staff and then we have a woman mercy baguma in glasgow who dies receiving no public support is found mm -hmm. dead next to her starving baby like how how can we exist in a country where those two things are happening and and where more value is put in bailing out big companies so they can continue to pay their shareholders and slash jobs rather than the lives of ordinary people who need our support it it, it makes me fume and there's just a final dimension to this that i think is important because we've been talking about how we build the future economy is that a lot of this money has actually gone to companies that are high carbon so EasyJet, mm -hmm. 600 million pounds. Mm -hmm. Schlumberger, great name. It's an oil giant. They got 415 million. They've not been asked to provide any kind of um, environmental guarantees or changes. Mm -hmm. There's no conditions that say, you know, you need to decarbonize, you need, you need to reduce your negative environmental impact. And the government has justified this by saying, well, it's an emergency and we have to protect jobs. But actually what they're doing is making one problem worse while sh solving another in the short term. It is possible to achieve two things at once. It is possible to save jobs, but also begin a fair and an orderly transition to a much greener future. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if, if COVID felt like a crisis, then you wait till the climate emergency gets worse. That is gonna be the biggest crisis we've seen. So it just, the whole thing stinks to me, to be perfectly honest. And I guess my big question about it is, why is this not more of a scandal? And, and how can we make sure that it stops? Because I'm not convinced that that we won't see more of this kind of unconditional writing checks to big companies as the economy suffers. Mm. And it's just shocking, isn't it? Um, I actually did a bit of a press search to see how well this had been picked up in, a, in other media and found so little, it was very dispiriting. The, the most press coverage mm. around May 16th to 19th when they decided that these companies would have to write this I promised to do um, yeah. if they were going to get funding. Um, but I had applied for the money before that date, could, didn't have to adhere to any of those standards even, which I don't know how rigorously they're being applied. And then the next thing that appears in the press is from the Daily Mail, actually, which I won't um, share because it's the Daily Mail, but it's <laughs> promising that Britain's middle classes will have to bail out this tax raise, they call it. Uh, to pay for the bailout for these companies with um, their own capital gains and corporation taxes. And that we're going to hear from Rishi Sunak in November about all these tax rises that we're going to have to face in order to pay for this programme, I'm presuming. Um, so yeah, um, really shocking that there's not better yeah. press coverage of this. It's no surprise, sadly, though. Um, mm. I'm so angry with the media and uh, the government, they they work in cahoots, don't they, to ensure that there is no change in this mm. in this higher societal setup mm. where for the boys, they all protect their own interests, they all went to school together, they all went to you know, they they don't understand how other people live, they totally don't care. Mm. Not everyone, but you know, <laughs> it feels like it. And the media and, and the government are completely working together to this dream 
where you know they're, they're, they're already gearing up to blame everyone on furlough that they're all lazy mm-hmm. they can all the other lazy people and benefits you know and, and if you haven't sorted yourself out it's your own fault for not working and it's nothing to do with your you know life chances you just rule ones oh yeah anyway <laughs> calm down a bit <laughs> angry <laughs> um and you know it's only going to get worse with brexit that it's again and the people that they've managed the media has spent the last however many years convincing that the problems are, you know, the benefit recipients or um, you know, low workers. It's all it's 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 been played brilliantly by the media, and and it's all you know come to a beautiful dream for the for the government to be able to prove that that yeah, had you um, you know, that, that this is you know that these government. Uh, I've gone off. I've gone too angry. I'm going to swear soon, but um, yeah, I just, I just think that there will be no political will at the top of government to make any of this any better because it's exactly what you know it maintains that status quo that that they have been born into. Mm. So many of them, and they're using people, the media, to to ensure that they they stir up, you know, look at. Don't look at the economy. Look at immigrants, for example, or anything. Yeah, you stir up to make sure that nothing changes in this time. And the same with the environment. They absolutely want to destroy that message. Mm. They're not interested. My next piece is a bit, little bit about the environment, and um, you know, they'll do some tokenism to say they're doing something, but really, mm. a change would have to, to mean telling their friends that they've got to change. You know, they've got to lose profits and no one's willing to do that in this wrong government. Yeah, I think that... Go on, Anna. I was just going to say, I think, you know, how angry we are and I can see mm-hmm. how angry people are on the chat. But So there's that and then there's all the positive solutions that, you know, you can see throughout this festival mm-hmm. and, and all the ideas for, for policies and practice change that our sector is producing. And then there is kind of this just silence really in in the really mainstream conversation and that for me feels like a massive challenge that we really need to find a way to bring all those things together and and that we have a conversation a a widespread conversation that is about here are the problems let's look them in the face and talk about them for real Mm -hmm. here are the solutions now let's make them happen you're right absolutely right yeah go make make use of this anger um and into those practical solutions because otherwise we're all just shouting it. <laughs> I can go and tell all my friends on Facebook who already all agree with me. <laughs> yeah. No point, is there? Sorry, I'm just being interrupted by a small chat. No, no, that's all right. Um, I wonder if we should give Anushka um, the op- opportunity to talk about her last five minutes left. Um, so let me see if I can get that one up for you. Um, Anushka, would you, do you want to take the la- a couple of minutes just to tell us about your last piece? We might not have much time to discuss it. Sorry about that. Yes, so I just was looking at, you know, it's September now and the government have launched this 3 billion energy um, efficiency plan, um, 2 billion of which will be for homeowners to be able to get grants to do some home um, green improvements um, and then another... One billion for public buildings to do the same. Um, there's there's bits of it that are good. Um, if you're on a low income, you can get 100% covered, um, ten thousand pounds, um, and you can tie it in. With, I forgot the name of it. The um, the scheme where you get some some money back as well for uh, you can tie into the national grid, working with that scheme as well. And then there's up to five thousand pounds for um other homeowners up to two thirds of the cost. Um, so there's claims from, from the government that this will create 140,000 jobs and make 650,000 homes more energy efficient, um, which all sounds great in reducing you know a fifth of CO2 emissions. Sort of major flaw that I've seen in, in it so far is that this if you you know, apply for your voucher now. It has to be spent by the 31st of March to 2021. Mm-hmm. 
And somehow this is going to create all these jobs. Miraculously, you're going to train up people in the construction industry, which is currently booming, actually, and, and has little capacity. You're going to create all these jobs, train people up, and spend the money and get all the supplies in in about you know seven six months um, it's going to cost it's you know potentially if you get in there early enough you might get some good outcomes but why again this sort of rush through ill team um without talking to the people who you know understood this scheme quickly um is 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 quite irritating um, it's only a drop in the ocean as well of what is really needed. Um, and the danger is, of course, is that you you do these quick fixes and you have awful tragedies like, you know, Grenfell. And if if these things are rushed through, there is serious danger that you get cowboys and, and also not properly thought about best use of, of these schemes. I've had a look this morning, quite complicated as well to get your head around. And um, I think and some people off. For sure. I'm mean, definitely all for, for investing in the green economy, but um, you know, it's it's a shame that it's the way it's been implemented. Yeah, I agree. And I actually it was very interesting yesterday there was a, in the Guardian there was an article um about Boris Johnson's U-turns. There was a really buried uh, paragraph about the green industrial revolution for the UK, where we saw Boris Johnson stealing Jeremy Corbyn's exact phrase about a green industrial revolution and saying that all of that's about to appear in their autumn state um you know this new industry to deliver a cleaner economy so i think there's probably more announcements to come on that but it will be interesting to see how well thought out they are if the past few months have been anything to go by yeah and and the thing is the, the i mean it's not exactly the green new deal is it let's face it but you know I, I don't want to be churlish because I think it's good. It, it's certainly a lot better than uh, some of the initiatives we've seen in the past in that it's straight grants. But one thing, the only companies that are going to be able to mobilise that fast are big companies. So again, and, and probably the only people who can take advantage of it are middle class homeowners. So again, we've kind of got this thing where actually the people who are living in freezing cold rented accommodation, who are using a meter, who they are the ones who need it. And yet actually this is kind of going to trickle towards the people who are doing okay already and it's just that lack of ability to join together well it's not ability lack of will to join together the social the environmental and the economic that's so disappointing yeah absolutely thank you okay i'll just take a minute to thank my panelists then thank you so much anna and anushka for joining me we were absolute stars i'm sure everyone will agree and thank you everybody who joined us in the chat today Thank you. Yeah, that's been great. <laughs> Thank you. That was really interesting. I think that was a great way to start to the morning for sure. So hopefully we'll see the rest of you around the festival today and tomorrow. Um, enjoy yourselves. Um, and yeah, have a good day. Thanks.